Welcome everybody to the Symposium of Paleontology and Phylogenetics. We would like to remind you a couple of things before starting. Please remember to respect our code of conduct. Let's be respectful to each other at all times. Also, as you may have noticed, the chat is closed for all attendees. However, we do encourage you to make questions through Zoom Q&A. Please use Q&A for questions and questions only. Also, for those of you who are watching us on YouTube, uh, feel free to write your questions on the comment section. Also, a little advice, if you could write the name of the speaker you're addressing before the question, it will be very helpful for both you and the speaker to find the questions later. Remember to upvote those questions that you're more interested in. If we don't have time to read all of the questions, we will read the ones that got the most votes. But don't worry if your question didn't get read, uh, the speakers will still be able to answer your questions through this text. Also and last, remember that discussions can continue via Discord. There is an especially chat room uh, that was created for that. Uh, we are very excited to be presenting the next symposium. It will be covering a wide variety of topics on plant invertebrate and vertebrate paleontology. We would like to thank you all, the attendees, for your support during the meeting and for being here with us today. And a special thank to our all guest speakers for accepting our invitation and for the enthusiasm you show from day one. Uh, so now let's get started with the symposium. Our first guest speaker is Dr. Mario Coiro. Uh, Mario works at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. He will be giving the talk in English and answering questions in English. And the title of his talk is Molecular Time Trees and the Macroevolution of Plants, Open Questions and Potential Solutions. Hi, Mario, and welcome. OK, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes. I'm clear. OK, so thank you very much, Nadia, for your kind introduction. And uh, uh, as you heard, I'm going to talk about molecular time trees and uh, what is their implication on the microevolution of plants and what can we do to improve these um, implications. So microevolution and the microevolutionary research program is the field of evolution that deals with the um, evolution above the species level. And mostly what it deals with is um, extinction, speciation, uh, morphological stasis, and uh, so on and so forth. And for a long time, this has been a field that has, uh, was mostly based on fossil history and the fossil record. However, especially after the uh, discovery of the molecular clock, so the fact that substitution rate in molecular sequences can be in some way correlated with time, uh, the use of dated phylogeny has become more and more um, widespread in the field of microevolution because phylogenies um, especially data phylogenies have, have some very interesting uh, characteristics or from the branching and the branching patterns, we can infer a lot of uh, very interesting things such as again, speciation and extinction rate, even if uh, that is partially doubtful. And uh, again, we can test, for example, hypothesis of um, correlation with geological events or uh, the influence of particular traits on diversification dynamics. Uh, and indeed, macroevolution now is mostly uh, dominated by phylogenies, even though uh, work is still done on um, fossil series. And phylogenies are very, very powerful, and they have been used for um, very interesting approaches. And this is just one example of, in this example, um, uh, the phylogeny of the angiosperm, who using only uh, extant data, data from extant flowers, have been used to reconstruct the aspect of the ancestral flower of the angiosperms. And fossils in this new age of phylogenies are, especially in the very early phase, they've been seen as sort of ancillaries. So fossils are still very important because uh, they are the only way in which we can sort of disentangle the relationship between the molecular rate and the, uh, the time that has passed since the split of two species. However, again, uh, the role as just node calibration is uh, infinitely smaller than the role they had in the very early phases of the macroevolution research program. Uh, however, 
since uh, the very beginning and uh, even more now has been quite apparent that some of the inferences that we can obtain from uh, data phylogeny seem to conflict with some of the data that have been, uh, or the inferences that have been done based on uh, fossil series. And though uh, these uh, discrepancies have become much smaller with the development of newer and newer methods that can be used on molecular phylogenies, this is still very true. And my favorite example, of course, is the conflict, the uh, incredible conflict between the uh, dated phylogenies of the angiosperms and the fossil record of the angiosperms. Because um, since the very beginning, uh, the dated phylogenies of the angiosperm have inferred uh, a crown age for the group that goes between the Permian and the Triassic, where the, the very first appearance and the diffusion of the angiosperm is in the Valanginian, which is much, much later than <laughs> the Permian or the Triassic, of course. So, um, however, in recent times, people have sort of become more recent times, uh, relatively speaking, is still uh, sort of eight years ago or 10 years ago, people have become more and more interested in sort of trying to bring back fossil data into uh, the field of microevolution and particularly integrating the fossil data in phylogenies. Because of course, phylogenies still have all those uh, very nice properties and we have a very large statistical toolkit that can help us to uh, ask and answer interesting questions using phylogenies. However, again, if we exclude uh, fossil data, then we can uh, lose or reach very inaccurate answers. And one way of integrating the fossil data in the phylogenies is uh, via so-called tip dating, uh, which is a method in which fossils are included in the, phylo in the dated phylogenies of uh, extant groups. Um, it can also be used for uh, entirely extinct groups, but of course it's uh, very, pretty much used for groups that also have molecular information. And using uh, the idea of a morphological clock, so the correlation between morphological change and time in whatever way, or using uh, the pattern of discovery of the fossil themselves to sort of deduce something about the diversification of the group just, uh, using the fossilized birth death model. Uh, people have tried again to reintegrate fossils uh, in uh, molecular phylogenies. And not only in the phylogenies themselves, but again, as this example, uh, from uh, Daniel Silvestro and collaborators using these uh, phylogenies that include fossils to really improve our macroevolutionary um, uh, inferences about, um, again, in this case, uh, the evolution of body mass, but uh, many other different things. So this would be very uh, nice for ask people that are interested in plants, but plant fossils are a bit complicated because most plant fossils that we find are, again, most similar to the uh, ginkgo litter that we have on the, um, on the left. Uh, and again, they are the litified version of uh, these riparian sediments on the right. What does this mean? Uh, plant fossils uh, usually come in um, disgregated parts. Uh, the usual uh, taxonomy and nomenclature of plant fossils means that uh, each different part usually gets a different name uh, with a formal uh, genus and species name. But again, uh, there are very, very rare cases in which we can find either parts that are connected together or we can infer via um, coexistence in the same uh, deposits or direct connection or anatomical similarities we can sort of reconstruct the actual plant that shed all these different parts. But this is extremely, extremely rare. And so usually paleobotanists have to deal with the, all these disgregated parts. So uh, some people, however, have still tried to uh, use the fossil record of the plants to make inferences about microevolution. Uh, and this is, uh, I feel a bit weird because again, uh, in, in both these cases, uh, genera have been taken as uh, the unit, but, but again, genera in, in plant fossils can mean uh, 
a, a, general, a genus of fossil leaves that can be produced by plants of different groups or a genus of pollen that can represent a single species and that these two genera maybe can be part of the same species. So of course, uh, they are more a proxy for disparity than diversity. Still, this has not stopped people to really use these uh, uh, in the classical paleobiological way, in a more or less informed way. Another way that we could try to integrate the fo fossil plants into um, the macroevolutionary research program is, again, via phylogenies, using these total evidence uh, approaches. However, uh, this has been only tried with uh, groups with a very um, a relatively low um, uh, species diversity. In this case, uh, we have Osmond Daisy and Fagus. And in both cases, uh, the fossils themselves are more used to really calibrate uh, the splits between the species, and they are not truly integrated in the macroevolutionary interpretation of these. And so, what I'm going to show you today uh, is. Um, uh, an approach using total evidence, which is molecular morphological data and tip dating to try to see if we can build um, a, a data tree that includes fossils in the plant record. And I've chosen the psychedelis uh, as my uh, group, psychedelis for the people that do not know them. They are these sort of things that look a bit like palms, but they're actually a group of gymnosperms that diverged from uh, the rest of the gymnosperms quite a long time ago, back in the Permian. Um, again, they are gymnosperms, so they are uh, plants that um, uh, do not have carpels or fruits, but they have naked seeds. Uh, Cycads are very interesting uh, because they, have a, they are quite notorious for being living fossils. So uh, what does this mean is that uh, people try to think that uh, cycads today are more or less the same as cycad in the fossil record, and uh, the cycad diversity in the fossil record is usually thought of being bigger than their diversity today. Uh, they also uh, have a rather interesting set of characters. So uh, this is a, a phylogenetic network based on the matrix from Rothwell and Stocky, 2016. Uh, it's a Bayesian phylogenetic network, and what this shows is that uh, it's a network of the seed plants and their closest relative. And here we can see that um, here we have the Paleozoic seed ferns and the Rogimnosperms. The, these are the more ancestral um, seed plants. We have a group that includes ginkgo and the conifers plus nitalis, the so called coniferophytes and ginkophytes. We have the angiosperms and the cycads, which are these two families, Amesia and Cycadaceae, they're attached. Uh, exactly at the cr uh, uh, cross of these three branches. So this sort of indicates that cycads have uh, a series of plesiomorphic characters that are not shared by the other group, two groups of extant uh, seed plants, the angiosperms and the incophytes and the coniferophytes. So uh, let's first of all say that the uh, uh, the idea of uh, cycads as living fossils is partially based on a lie, so on, or better, on the fact that in the Mesozoic there are a lot of cycad-like leaves that are produced by another group called the Benetitalis. They are not cycads. However, even when we consider only true cycads, so not Benetitalis, the classic idea is that the cycads reach their peak of morphological disparity and diversity in the Jurassic, and then they um, followed our decline uh, that uh, culminated up to today. And this is the view from the fossil record, but uh, recently, more recently, again, still 10 years ago, uh, uh, molecular data have sort of indicated that actually most of the species of the cycads are recent, and even the family are more recent than we thought. They are from the Cretaceous. However, this phylogeny makes very poor use of the fossil record of the cycad because it only uses three cycad fossil to only calibrate the nodes. So what I wanted to see is whether it was possible to use the still good fossil record of the cycads to uh, integrate this into a phylogeny, a data phylogeny of the cycads. And uh, with this phylogeny, whether we could actually answer the traditional hypothesis about their evolution. So first is the Jurassic peak hypothesis. Again, the disparity should peak in the Jurassic and then um, 
uh, sort of decrease up until now. Also the synchronous radiation hypothesis, which is the hypothesis that comes from uh, this phylogeny that says that all the exon genera sort of radiate at that ex more or less the same time. As well as an hypothesis called the latitudinal contraction hypothesis that uh, uh, states that uh, mostly cycads were diffused at very high latitudes before the Miocene and the exon distribution is the result of a shrinking of the uh, form of fossil distribution. So to do, uh, to answer this, I collected a lot of morphological data from scratch from the cycads. I also used a phylogeny that included 64% of extant species diversity because cycads have only more or less 350 species, which is very, very convenient, um, including three molecular markers and 31 leaf and cuticle characters, which of course to sort of vertebrate people will seem very few characters, but of course uh, for plant people, these are quite a, quite a lot, especially for only leaf characters. And they decided to use only leaves because of course the leaf record is one of the most complete. And this way I would sort of avoid using uh, non-overlapping uh, taxa with non-overlapping uh, morphological sets such as trunks and leaves and so on. And uh, uh, again, I coded 59 fossil leaf taxa and I coded them at the species level or specimen level. So I did not assume that uh, genera or uh, other units are um, by any biological meaning. And then each of these fossils was um, the age uncertainty or the dating was implemented and incorporated in the analysis. And I used this total evidence dating using the fossil list of death prior. And again, you can see that I got a tree, a tree with, with which um, uh, with a lot of sort of unresolved nodes, but still a lot of surprising, surprisingly resolved nodes. And the first big surprise was that most of these fossils are actually not very closely related to either of the two extant families. They are found outside, but still there are quite a few fossils, even some that were not before associated with the two extant families that seem to be uh, actually related. Uh, here is the, the dated phylogeny with the, um, the uncertainty. So here you can see that, um, for example, here, the Zamiesi, the, the major family originated more or less in the Jurassic. Uh, Psychadesi has a very, very long um, stem group, but this we sort of already knew. And regarding the ages of the extant genera, we can see that um, um, they are very, very close. However, they are not as close as previously supported, but still, uh, let's say we cannot really reject uh, synchronous radiation. We can also use this phylogeny and the morphological data to test the Jurassic peak of disparity. And surprisingly, there is no Jurassic peak of disparity. As you can see, the, uh, the top of this part is reached in the early Cretaceous and the late Cretaceous, and is maintained up until the Paleogene, and the, there is a drop in disparity in between the Paleogene-Neogene uh, transition, and this is independent of the way that we construct the disparity on the tree. The disparity also, uh, uh, looking at this PCO axis uh, expands up to the Cretaceous. And then uh, we can see that uh, in the uh, extant species, what happens is that most of the disparity was present before is reduced and the dis lift of disparity is dominated by the Zamiesi. And also another thing that I can do is reconstruct uh, using the fossil data, the ancestral latitudinal span. So see, this is just the northernmost and southernmost distribution, and we can see that uh, the maximum distribution is reached in the near Cretaceous, and then there is a shrinking of the distribution up to the actual latitude in the Neogene. So again, we can see that we can reject the Jurassic uh, peak of disparity, but we can definitely support this hypothesis of uh, the shrinking. So in conclusion, I can uh, sort of show you that fossils improve microevolutionary analysis of plants, as especially the cycads. Uh, a good knowledge of comparative exon material and the fossils is needed. So the, again, uh, I had to sort of uh, collect the characters almost from scratch. And the species and specimen level coding has a great potential, especially in dated analysis. But again, there is a lot of uncertainty that can be probably only resolved by, um, by um, uh, using full plants. 
A few caveats. So the first record of the cycads is particularly good because it's a good sampling to time. This might not be the case for many other plant groups. Sampling of complete foliage taxa, as I did. So I also sort of excluded taxa that was very patchy. It's the sort of ideal situation. So this could have made the analysis a bit better. And the methods might be harder to apply to larger groups, such as the angiosperms. Thank you very much for uh, time. And if you have questions, I'm uh, open to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Mario, for your really interesting talk. Uh, sadly, we got uh, out of time for questions, but maybe at the end of the symposium, if some questions arise, we can discuss it then. And also, Discord is still a platform available for contacting Mario and asking about his talk. Thank you very much again. Nadia? Thank you, Dr. Coiro. Now, uh, our next speaker is Selena Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith works at the University of Michigan in the United States. She will be giving the talk in English and answering questions in English. And the title of her talk is Importance of Morphology and Fossils in Macroevolutionary Studies, a case study from Singi Varieties. Hello, Selena, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to present my work here. And um, um, thank you, Mario, for your talk. That kind of set up my talk nicely. Um, the um, fossil record of plants, like with other organisms um, can give us a lot of important evidence for taxa and characters and distributions that we can't infer or predict based on molecular or modern evidence alone. And this is why thinking about fossils and using the fossil data is so important. We really need that to understand um, things like speciation and extinction, past biodiversity, by geographic patterns um, and ecosystem composition and distributions and how ecosystems and organisms have responded to environmental changes, whether those are long-term or short-term catastrophic events. And um, for me, one of the key challenges in a lot of this is accurately um, placing these fossils in a taxonomic and phylogenetic framework. And as Mario already alluded to, plants are a little trickier than animals a lot of the time because we commonly find them, um, their parts disassociated from each other, right? And this happens during the lifetime of a plant, right? A plant's shedding leaves, it's shedding reproductive parts. Um, so us paleobotanists have to deal with a, each of these parts being given different names. And if we're lucky, we can find these all attached and we can come up with a whole plant concept, which is really helpful for comparing and putting in context to modern plants. But usually we don't have that. And what we're dealing with is different parts and based on which parts we have and how we understand they go together, we may interpret them differently. So our goal is always to try and get um, whole plants, but like Mario said, that's very rare. And so this is just something that we need to keep in the back of our mind and it can really, um, really be hard in terms of uh, diversity analyses. Um, it's really easy to overestimate numbers of species. So morphology and anatomy is really useful to look at, um, partly because we can help link these different parts together. And, um, but also when we're thinking about um, phylogenetically placing these fossils and understanding things like character evolution, um, the morphology and anatomy is critical for that. And so my lab group has spent a lot of time looking at reproductive structures 
um, because these usually have an abundance of taxonomically useful characters. Um, so I've got up here a bunch of different pictures from uh, one of my favorite group of flowering plants, which are the monocots. Um, so monocot leaves to date, nobody's done enough work to really um, be able to get as many characters as Mario has for his cycads, although hopefully we're, we can improve that. Um, but the fruits and seeds are really diverse. And so what I wanna share with you today is a bit of our work on this group, Zingiberales. So this is a, a group that many of you, or probably all of you are familiar with in some way. It's a lot of economically and ecologically important plants. And these include things like cardamom and turmeric and ginger, um, bananas and plantains, um, arrowroot for arrowroot cookies, as well as ornamentals like the torch gingers and the lobster claws or heliconias. So why did we pick gingers? Um, they're not just pretty, right? We don't have many charismatic mega plants um, to get people excited about, but this is one group, but also they have a pretty decent fossil record. Um, they're also interesting to think about how fossils can help us better understand modern plants because their phylogeny has been really difficult to resolve with confidence. So even with 83 genes, um, we still can't resolve this. There's still conflict between the genes. So can the fossils help us do that? And there's this um, question about whether part of this conflict is because the group had an ancient rapid radiation. And we see potential signature of that when we look at a time-scaled phylogeny. Um, we get these really short branches in the basal nodes of the trees. Um, and we typically get the conflict, most of the conflict resolves around these basal nodes. So um, the banana family is sometimes found sister to the rest of the families in the group. And sometimes we get a clade as shown here of the so-called banana families, which include bananas, heliconias, bird of paradise, and orchidanthas, um, compared to, or sister to the gingers, which include the prayer plants, the spiral gingers, the true gingers, and the canna lilies. So what can we do about this? Um, collect more data, right? Um, but we already know more molecular data is not necessarily going to help. So let's collect data from taxa that were around at the time of these shorter branches, right? So early on in the diversification of the group, and what's extinct now. So the Zingiberales have a pretty rich leaf and fruit and seed fossil record. Um, there's no pollen for this group because the pollen has no X sign, so it doesn't get recorded. Um, today, this is a pantropical distribution, but in the past, they've been quite different. So I'm showing you on the right here, um, late Cretaceous, Paleogene, and Neogene. And one of the key things to note is how much further north a lot of these fossils go. So we, we get them up into Alaska, Greenland, even Siberia in the late Neogene. Um, and this um, group has been used as an indicator of past tropical or fast free environments. And so even the ecological evolution, if we can put these fossils into a phylogenetic framework, um, we can use that to test whether they actually have been tropical all this time. So we've been focusing on, um, on the seeds for this group. Um, and I'm showing you the distribution map here. Um, the oldest seed is of a lot of interest um, in terms of being able to calibrate nodes. And that is the seed Spiromatis burmum chandleri, which um, comes from North Carolina, so the East Coast of North America. 
Um, but we have a few other Cretaceous seeds, which are found in Mexico, um, Europe, so Germany, um, and India. And the most widespread seed is this um, species Spermum wetzleri, which was found throughout Eurasia from about the Eocene um, through the Pliocene. So why the focus on the seeds? Um, so these, um, first of all, include the oldest fossil for the whole order. So if we're thinking about note dating, that's got a lot of interest. Um, but there's also been a lot of disagreement about where these seeds fit within the family. So we can't use them for node dating until we know where they fit in the phylogeny. And there are competing hypotheses. The first um, scientists who worked on these put them in the true ginger families in Gibraci. And later workers argued that these seeds actually belonged in the banana family and even erected a new subfamily for them. Um, alternatively, these could also represent um, some kind of ancestral lineage that doesn't fit in one of the modern families today. So what can we do? So we set out um, much like um, Mario did with his leaves, we had to collect a lot of new morphology data. And we did that by using digital morphology, so micro CT data. Um, and we need that for both the fossils and extant taxa. So we spent a lot of time building this morphological framework and the CT was useful because it was non-destructive. So we were able to get data from museum and herbarium specimens um, that were rare or fragile. So where we wouldn't have, have been able to get internal morphological data without using this non-destructive technique was also fast. So we've been able to collect data for a lot of species. And, and it's useful on difficult to prepare materials. So these seeds have very hard seed coats. There's a lot of silica in them. Um, some of you may know, for example, canna um, is sometimes called Indian shot because the seeds could actually be used as bullets and they will go through wood. So they're, they're that hard. So imagine traditional histological techniques trying to cut through that. So x-rays become much more effective. Um, we can also get both internal and external data which is useful and um, and that was especially good for fossils where we don't always get to choose what plane of section the fossils are in so this way we could kind of double check we can get just the the standard planes of section that one would take but we can also get kind of weird orientations to be able to compare with our fossils and really understand the morphology we can also digitally dissect these and understand what might happen during the process of fossilization as things are rotting or being filled in with sediment. We can make fake fossils, um, infills of spaces and that kind of thing. So we, we've, we get a lot of useful data. So I don't wanna go into too much detail um, here the, the main point is we can recognize a lot of different features for these seeds. Um, before our work, the, these four characters in orange were the main ones that were used to distinguish between the eight families. And the main argument with the fossils centered around this structure called the calasal chamber, which is very prominent in the banana family, Musaceae, and was thought to be absent in the other families. So um, my former postdoc, John Benedict, did a lot of this work analyzing hundreds of samples. And we came up with 51 seed characters for these different species, um, and, as well as a bunch of fossils. So you can get a sense for some of the diversity that we found here. Um, we think they're, they're both pretty to look at, but this is one of the most diverse um, flowering plant seed groups, or flowering plant um, diverse seeds in the flowering plants. So been fun to work on for that. 
Um, and with this new data set, we could recognize distinctive suites of characters at the family and subfamily level. So we could get comparable data for the fossils. You can see here um, digital sections from the micro CT data for, for these different fossils. We spent a lot of time focusing on spermum since that includes this oldest fossil, which is of the most interest in terms of note dating. And whether, um, whether we place this fossil in the bananas or the gingers as a stem group or a stem calibration, or if we can place it into the crown, <coughs> Um, can have big impacts on the age estimates. And um, Mario talked about um, tip dating, and that's one of the things that we're, we're working on now. Um, we've done a whole bunch of different analyses um, through time, um, and I've color coded the different families here since I'm Sure, a lot of you won't remember the actual groups, but you can can remember the, the colors and relatives. So um, bananas in yellow and gingers in pink. <coughs> so if we look at our fossils, um, when we put them in the analyses uh, individually, they come out in a bunch of different places, some in crown gingers, some as stem gingers, um, we've got uh, some in bananas, which are expected to be in bananas. But if we analyze them all together, um, they come out in different positions. And you can see here, we've got a big polytomy. So we're, we don't have a lot of resolution um, in this analysis. Um, but this doesn't have that many of the, the modern taxa in it because we were limiting it to species where we had matching molecular and morphological data. So, um, so one of the things that we thought um, we would do next is then change our sampling to expand um, the Zingiberi C and see if we can resolve this better. And one of the reasons we think that we're seeing these different relationships, whether we analyze the fossils individually or not, is that the fossils are occupying a very different part of the morphospace. They're clustering together more. And so um, we need to fully represent kind of that morphospace in our analyses by having multiple fossils. And if you just have one, then it's easy to um, kind of pull things in weird directions and get them um, get them acting as long weird branches. So you need to include lots of fossils when you're trying to place fossils phylogenetically. Um, since that analysis, we've actually discovered um, a new fossil um, from the Indian Deccan beds and We've gotten further data on what used to be known as Mesocardiospermum, um, which is now Mamordio carpon. Um, and again, the, the Orthogonospermum, we really, we wouldn't have known about without the micro CT data. This was never observed um, on the face of a rock. It was found by looking through CT scans of, of these charts. So, that's pretty exciting and we've got some really nice detail now of them. Um, and when we, um, what we're doing now is, is trying to further refine these analyses. Um, so you can see the um, sampling for the ginger family has been expanded here. The fossils are indicated by these pink arrows. Um, I don't expect you to read all of these, um, this is um, parsimony-based analyses with a backbone constraint, just using the um, morphological data. And we've got some Bayesian analyses that are underway. Um, 
if we look at some of these preliminary results, we get some interesting patterns. For example, um, two of the fossils are falling within the banana family. Um, one of these is this new Indian fossil and the other Trichostata of Carpan is actually from Mexico. So when we think about biogeographic relationships, that's, that's kind of an interesting um, pairing. Um, this isn't the first time that we've actually found this. There's a, uh, some kind of monocot we can't put in a, in a family um, called Viracarpan um, that is also found in both India and Mexico um, in the Cretaceous. Um, this um, undescribed spermatospermum is very consistently all of the time coming out with this group Siphonochyloidae. Um, the fossils from Germany, the modern plants are in Africa today. And um, one of the biggest things is um, this genus Spermatospermum is not monophyletic, so it's consistently being split apart, but with this um, different data set with more morphological data from more species, um, we're getting better resolution. We're not getting um, big polytomies. And um, we're seeing a consistent clade between that pretty widespread long-lived gene uh, species, Spermatospermum wetzeri, with the other Indian fossil. Um, we get a clade of North American species, so that includes um, this oldest fossil. And those both float around, but are found in this um, subfamily Alpinioidae, which is largely old world um, taxa. So what have we learned through this? So one thing, um, just like Mario was saying, we really need a lot of detailed morphology for placing our fossils. It's critical. Um, that usually means starting from, from scratch on it. And I think it's really imperative to understand the morphology well and the molecular data can give us a good context um, to understand which traits are homoplasious or not, but that's, that's really important. Um, so that helped us to kind of understand why we were having this conflict in the placement of the fossils. And now I think we're, we're understanding that and having more confidence about where the fossils are falling out. Um, I would also say, I think one thing that's become apparent is um, not to analyze single fossils, but to um, also analyze groups of closely related fossils in order to infer phylogenetic position. And again, some of this is just understanding how they're influencing each other, but it's important to test. Um, and I think this, um, com this approach we took of kind of doing a low density but broad sampling for initial analyses and then going in for a more high density but narrow sampling um, was really helpful in getting um, more resolution for where the fossils are being placed. So like I said, our next step, one of the next things we're currently doing is um, tip dating for the tree with the fossils. And now we've even got more fossils to include in that. Um, we're also um, looking at continuous characters, which there's, there's been several recent papers on. And with the CT data, we can potentially um, get a lot of these kinds of traits um, including kind of morphometric um, data um, that could be useful to add another dimension to understanding where our fossils go. So in summary, um, non-destructive fast techniques like micro CT can improve our ability to collect and interpret data, um, include as many fossils as you can when you're trying to place a fossil species. 
Um, and a lot of times we need to do multiple analyses at different data densities to, to really be confident about where they go. Um, and our current data would really support that Zindabrailis are much older than previous reconstructions have suggested. Um, and that there's some interesting um, biogeographic story um, where Europe and North America may have been um, kind of centers of origin from which some of these groups spread out. So we'll, we can test that. And we need these large comparative data sets in order to evaluate the, the fossils um, and understand broader um, patterns of evolution within, within these groups. So with that, I'll end there and thank you. Thank you very much, Selena. Uh, and beautiful work and, and beautiful fossils also. <laughs> uh, we have uh, several questions to both you and Mario Coito, so maybe we can do, uh, uh, I can ask the Palibot any questions now, and then we go to uh, invertebrates with Damian Perez. Uh, so to Selena Smith, uh, does the technique that you use work for all the other material too? What about compressed material? Um, the so, um, let me pull it. So does it work for compressed material? Yes. Um, so, um, so we've gotten, well, Steve Manchester has done a lot of work with compressions. And so it depends on the compression, um, but it, it can work. So it's definitely worth trying that. Um, okay. Uh, and if, if, if it works for all the older material too, or? Yeah, yeah, we've we've used it. Um, we've used it on carboniferous material. I've scanned stromatolites from Precambrian. Like it's yeah. Um, it it works on um, different um, X-ray densities of the material. So it's more about how it's preserved, and as long as there's a contrast between the fossil and the the mineral matrix it's embedded in. It should work. It doesn't matter how old it is. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can be the Cretaceous relationship between India and Mexico in the early Cretaceous? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Can be the relationship between India and Mexico in the early Cretaceous an artifact of lack of fossil record? Yeah, so that's one of the things um, we think is probably um, probably the case that this is is indicating that we're we're missing a whole bunch of the fossil record kind of between those areas. Um, there's not really any way that there could have been direct dispersal between the two groups. So um, what we what we um, hypothesized with Vera Karpan, um was that it's indicating that there's a lot of fossil record for that group that is missing that would have kind of filled in what, what would be a logical um, a connection between those two regions. Yeah. Okay. Mm, next question is, uh, all the included fossils are from seeds and fruits. Are there potentially useful information that can be extracted for from other organs? Yeah, so um, so what I showed you focused on seeds and fruits. Um, we're actually spending a lot of time on, on leaves um, like Mario. So, so we've been developing a, a big data set and um, trying to get students to code <laughs> the characters for that, which is a little harder when we can't get into the lab right now to look at specimens. Right. Um, but, but yeah, um, I, I think there I think there is some potential. The leaves are not as um, they don't have as many features, so they're not as distinctive as the the seeds and fruits in this group. 
but I think overall it's it's really important to look at at both kinds of organs. Okay, I'm and, following up a little bit on that question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, are there uh, cuticles or cuticle information that can be used also? So the the fossil leaves for the gingers often don't have the cuticle preserved. Um, there are a few, and so we've been um, I've been my lab has been clearing a lot of fossil, a, a lot of modern leaves. So the cuticle is one thing that we're looking at. And there are some different um, epidermal patterns with the different groups. We just haven't gotten far enough into that yet to, to, to know how distinctive it will be. But some of the families are definitely show some distinctive patterns. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... I'm, there are a couple of questions more to you, Selena, but maybe uh, you can answer them writing and I can uh, ask the Dr. Coiro uh, a question also. Um, Dr. Coiro, the difference between the Jurassic or early Cretaceous peak would be related to uncertainties in the datation? So, um... This is uh, easily answered because uh, what I have done, I've also uh, reconstructed the disparity on 100 trees from the posterior sample of the MCMC. So these trees have very different dates for the, especially the most important nodes. And still this Cretaceous peak is maintained. So what changes is only the slope of the change of disparity that maybe it's a bit higher in the Jurassic, but it's still at its highest in the Cretaceous. And this is probably due to the fact that when Harris elaborated the Jurassic hypothesis, he didn't have a lot of Cretaceous and Paleogene fossils that were discovered later by people such as Sergio Kanjelski and uh, Zlatovic Kwacek. So yeah, it is probably not an artifact artifact of the dating. Okay, thank you very much. And um, there is a, a question. Uh, for, for both of you, actually, it says Mario uses leaves and Selena seeds, both with molecular information. Since the fossil position is determined by this information, the question for both would be how well do you think that the morphological evolution of those organs actually represent the, the evolution of the plant? Do you want to go first, Mario? Do you want me to? <laughs> well. As you prefer, <laughs> because this is the, the million dollar question that we cannot really answer. I mean, in the case of the cycads, what I can say is that, um, at least in the extant species, uh, leaf morphology and especially cuticle morphology seem to be um, to have a strong evolutionary signal. So it's this, it sort of follows the molecular phylogeny pretty strictly, which sort of makes me at least partially confident that it might have some good biological signal, but of course this can be only tested, you know, with full uh, plant reconstructions and for cycad there is only one and it's not even, it's just sort of the male plant and not even the whole plant. So yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, I think that's, you know, something we always need to keep in the back of our head and if we don't have the full plant we can't we can't really know and that's something I'm hoping to look at a little bit um, with the data we've got for gingers and a couple of other monocot groups is is how how similar or different um, is the evolution within the the traits of vegetative and reproductive structures and I think you know we, we don't I mean part of the problem with plants is we still don't have a lot of the morphology for the modern species to be able to evaluate this. So anytime we want to go and look at that, we have to do all of the work to collect the modern data and the fossil data. But I think it's a really important question and something I'm hoping we'll be able to um, to test in the next few years. Okay, thank you very much to both of you. And maybe we can keep discussing this in the break. So thank you. And Nadia. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Now our guest, uh, our next guest is Damian Perez. Uh, Damian is working in San Pat Conicet in Argentina. 
He will be giving the talk in English and answering questions in both Spanish and English. Uh, the, talk, the title of his talk is Multiple Tools on Phylogenetic Analysis to Assess the Macroevolutionary History of the Carditidae as an example for the study of fossils and living bivalve evolution. Thank you, Naya. Thank you. I am sharing the screen. Oh. Uh, well, uh, my main research is in the Carditidae, a uh, poorly known family of bivalves. And the objective of this talk is view some phylogenetic approaches applied to this group and think. Uh, how about how this could be extended to other bivalve groups. This is a very recent phylogenetic tree of all bivalves, and we can show the heterodonta. Uh, this is the most successful living group of bivalves. In, and recently, uh, the heterodonta was split in two groups, the archeterodonta and the euterodonta. The Architeronda is comprised, is comprised by four living families, the Astartide, the Crassatelide. The Astartide has a, a rich fossil record in the Mesozoic, but, and the Condylocarie and Carditide. Today, I, why we think that Condylocarie is a, a group originated among the carditids. But all this archeteronda, all this group, the archeteronda, is based on molecular data, but uh, there are not morphological synapomorphies proposed. Among carditids, the carditide has a long fossil record, beginning in the late Triassic with the paleocarditine and living today. Their maximum of specific diversity was during Eocene and early Miocene. And we can view this uh, diversity across time of the group. And we recognize, we, we re recognize uh, near to 69 genera and uh, almost 800 species uh, among carditid. Uh, there are some phylogenetic relationship proposed. So there are uh, some, some ones of the most important. First, the separation between marsupial and non-marsupial carditids, uh, the red circle marked the marsupium, uh, this separation was named caritine and tecaline. Second one, uh, the two lineages by, based on external sculpture of shell, the planico state and the altico state. And the last one, a scheme of seven, seven subfamilies that, that is the proposal of Shaban in the treatise on invertebrate paleontology, the fundamental book in the, in the area. And my objective, my initial objective is reconstruct, uh, constru will build a morphological matrix for this group. Uh, this is the, the beginning with in, including Seven, 77 species level terminals and more than 140 characters. This covered the approximately the 60% of the known genera. And I, I used continuous and discrete characters. With this initial morphological matrix, uh, use it as a bus line some lines of research were performed. This is a reduced sketch of these lines and approaches, and we are we're going to view some of them and 
the emerging consequence and discussion or the, and discussions uh, from, from here. This is the first and initially main objective. Okay. That is the phylogenetic search and discuss the previous proposals. For this, I carry out different search strategies, equal and in play weighting, uh, in play weighting using different values of K, all of this under parsimony using T TNT software. That go. Uh, based on the three topologies obtained, I analyze the morphological disparity of the group. And, the, and, I, and I analyze philomorphic spaces. For this, I use the package class in R uh, with, the, with these metrics mentioned. And for this, uh, from this, I obtain three or perhaps four main groups. I, I talk about this later. Also, I use the morphological matrix and the three topology for search the phylogenetic signal of the characters. Some groups of characters show higher values of signal. For example, the uh, scutcheon, the hinge, right and left, and the sculptor, the external sculptor. With these multiple sources of data, I perform new taxonomic discussions and propose new phylogenetic relationships as the establishment of new previously unrecognized lineages. For example, the cardiovisata, uh, and here is named Carditia, but this name is no longer valid. The cardiovisata is a group of three subfamilies uh, with a particular mode of life. All of these are epivisite uh, by abyssus. Other groups as the cyclocardida, uh, joining the miodomeridine, the scalaricardidine. Scalaricardidine is a new subfamily proposed here. And uh, this had new definitions and established new synapomorphics for each clade. So this new phylogenetic scheme, scheme is the baseline for other new discussions. For example, the case of the genus Cyclocardia. Cyclocardia is one of the genus of carated, um, perhaps a genus of beavers with more species assigned, they are to 180, and is uh, one of the traditional naming wastebasket taxa. So from here, together with Luciana Giacchetti uh, and the new information and performing new phylogenetic analysis and disparity analysis, uh, we established a new landscape for cyclocardia. Split these uh, species, species genus in new genera and new lineages and release the relationship of cyclocardia with other candidates. There are, uh, now, there are five genera established uh, apart from cyclocardia. Also, with this new phylogenetic scheme, uh, allow me to st study other lines. This is a temporary calibrated phyl phylogeny of the group from Triassic to recent times. One of the most interesting things to observe is this temporal gap without record of near to 100 million years. But this temporal gap matches with the most important morphological gap in the philomorphic space. If we consider that molecular clouds place the origin of the caridids in the Jurassic and the main lineages within the group appear in late Triassic or Paleocene, we have interesting questions for work from here. For example, what happened bet between Triassic, Paleocarditine, and the post-Triassic Carditids 
what happened during the Jurassic and the early Cretaceous, uh, what what are the what are the relationship uh, among cardiids among lineage of cardiids in in this sense as a fair example I am arriving in the Pornian Cretaceous genus Xenocardita a genus from Lebanon and with new phylogenies and observation of morphological feathers, but based in this new context, I analyzed the placement of this genus and obtained uh, a possible placement near to the base of the Venere Cardini, a trip with, uh, among Venere Cardinae. And the biochron of this genus is early Cretaceous. Um, the, uh, this led me, led the origin of the Benigarini to the early Cretaceous. This is a first attempt to search for the tempo of the emergence of these groups. Also, the new phylogenetic scheme as, uh, can be used as a backbone for further studies. In my case, I am inter interested in macroevolutionary studies. For example, this is an optimization of size of shells through phylogeny. Green color indicates large sizes and red color indicates tiny sizes. Well, we can observe that size is not randomly distributed. Some lineages are characterized by tiny sizes, such as the Myodomeridine and Pleuromeris, and other present large sizes, as is the case of the planicostate carated. This is a good point for generating new ideas and new hypotheses. Other example is optimizing characters of ontogenetic interest. For example, uh, the sculpture of external radial ribs. Radial ribs are sharpness in the Benericardini and smooth in the Benericorini, the Planico state and the Altico state. Um, with this approach, we can think about the origin of both groups, um, search for the origin, search for the relationship, um, and a spoiler. In this case, it seems to be that Planico states are paramorphic, Planico states, the smooth uh, sculpture are paramorphic to Aztec state. And perhaps this claim was originated, originated from this other one by a telegraphic process. Another example uh, that, well, is the, uh, I want to finish with this example. And a study of a study of a possible case of co-option within cardiids. Uh, remember the case of marsupial cardiids, marsupial non marsupial groups separated by the presence of this structure. With this new phylogenetic scheme, uh, the tecaline, the marsupial, are are the sister clade or nested within the subfamily Cardiidina, both groups of epibicide bivalves. This marsupial or incubatory chamber co have originated from the visal gap, an structure present in all Cardiidina, uh, from for the protruding of visus, and this structure could be could have originated from this. Now we are studying this possibility together with Ignacio Sot, and we develop a three-step evolutionary pathway to explain this possible adaptation of the visa gap into an inquatory structure. In summary, the, this is, in summary of this journey, I want to remark some points. Uh, there are different approaches taken together with some common objectives. Basis of all approaches are solidly built 
matrix of morphological characters. And phylogenetic search is only the first step of this research. Um, let me to me, uh, thanks to many, many, many people that collaborate with this work. Uh, first, the curator of different collections and the people who collaborate and help me with many oops. And I am grateful to the Club Social Salud de Alepo and the financial support by fund funding our grants from different uh, institutions. And uh, I invite you to join the Asociación Paleontológica Argentina and the Sociedad Argentina de Biología Evolutiva uh, for, uh, for you. <laughs> and thanks to the uh, organizing committee, committee and the organizer uh, and the coordinator of this symposium for, for inviting me. Thank you very much, Damian. Uh, really interesting work. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you. One is, uh, why do you think that we haven't found those Jurassic Cardiidae yet? Uh, Jurassic Cardiidae uh, is a problem, but uh, there are Jurassic Cardiidae, and uh, I think that uh, need a re-study, a reinterpretation, and uh, in, and there there. Uh, and need to be included in new in new systematic stu studies uh, before include in this research in this phylogenetic research. There are some records from New Zealand, from uh, Patagonia, and uh, from England. Okay, thank you very much. And a second question is: Have you tried using geometric morphometrics? Characters to the phylogenetic analysis. Uh, I I try to uh, use different approach forces. Uh, one of them is the inclusion of uh, of direct inclusion of uh, geometric morphological characters, but uh, because there are uh, sometimes an unique structure, the shell, the bulbs, uh, uh, they. Don't, don't allow me to uh, separate uh, di different characters. And I prefer to change between, between morpho uh, geometric morphological characters uh, and extract to new morphological uh, meristic char characters. OK, thank you very much, Damian. Thank you. Nadia? Uh, it's time now for the coffee break. Thank you, Damian. A little announcement for those of you watching in, in YouTube. Uh, we will return in around uh, 25 minutes for the keynote mm -hmm. because the first talk after the break won't be recorded or streamed in YouTube. Uh, for all of you here at Zoom, uh, just stay and we will be back in a couple of minutes with the next talk. Thank you.